You are listening to Future Based Podcast. We are an interdisciplinary philosophy platform organizing and initiating interdisciplinary collaborations ranging from artists in residency to reading sessions and publishing articles and podcasts. For more information, visit futurebased.org. Contextually aware means that I'm reacting to something that I see in my direct um, environment, but then I'm, I'm diving in it to kind of uh, understand what system it's part of. Welcome to Future Based Podcast with your host, Sabine Winters. My name is Lisa Mandemaker. I'm a social designer and a speculative designer. Um, I specialize in design for debates. I'm very interested in new technologies and uh, from new sci-fi stuff to the, the, the technology that gets introduced uh, to us on a daily basis and how we adapt to it and how it changes our behavior and expectations. Lisa Mandemaker is a social designer with a strategic, contextually aware and critical approach to research and practice. She considers design as a tool for debate and crafts future narratives through designed artifacts, using these as a form of storytelling to challenge assumptions, questions or excite. Lisa's work centers on the effects of emerging technology on people and their behavior. In this podcast, she elaborates about her working methods and why, in her opinion, we need designers to create new rituals. In the last two years, I've been focusing on projects around uh, the beginning of life and the technology that gets introduced in that domain, which I think is a very interesting uh, domain to think about as a designer. And my background is in product design. Uh, I studied, I did a BA in Arnhem at Artes. And after that, I went to, I moved to London to do an MA at the Royal College of Arts. Uh, I always wanted, well, I, I, I went to the Royal College of Art for this master's program, Design Interactions. This was um, uh, Anthony Dunn and Fiona Raby were the head of that department. And I was very interested in speculative design. So I really wanted to study there. Um, but unfortunately this, um, this department got shut down right like a few months before I was going to start there. So then I uh, changed to design products and I got my MA uh, at design products, which was also very cool. It was just really different, uh, but it, I'm happy I did that. I've been working by myself for such a long time, but now uh, I'm doing more collaboration. So I need to be more open about the steps that I'm taking. So I'm learning so much more about my own methods because I do follow a method, um, but it's so intuitively that it's hard to explain what the, what the method is exactly. Um, but it does come down to, um, well, you know, the famous double diamonds uh, theory. It's the, it's a design theory that you kind of, uh, two diamonds and then you, you, you go, you go white, you do all the research and then you find something and then you narrow down to a design brief. Then you go white again. Uh, and then you narrow down to the realization, uh, of the, uh, of the final thing that you're making. And m my, uh, methods aren't that linear, but it kind of comes down to that double diamonds method. So when I start with a project, I explore the, uh, the theme. Mostly I start with a very abstract theme, really broad. Um, for example, the beginning of life. And I just put everything on a wall, uh, all the different things that I can find. It's articles or research in science or um, more culture stuff, films, um, exhibitions if it links only just a slight bit it will come on my wall and then i kind of arrange it uh, but this wall is very 2d uh, but in my head it kind of yeah it's something that i can just you know wander in and then new uh, connections will come up i call it uh, a mind's palace uh, it's from uh, sherlock holmes uh, he does that as well <laughs> 
<laughs> and maybe that Sherlock Holmes link isn't that like far stretched. It's it's just you know uh, uh, you're looking for some kind of path and. There's so many possibilities and there's not one right way. Well, Sherlock Holmes always tries to find the answer. But yeah, I try to find different answers. But yeah, the Mind Palace always works really well as a, um, uh, how do you call it, like a metaphor. Um, I think I can best explain it by the, my latest project, the Lab Romanticism project. Um, this was uh, a project I started after uh, the design for a, a speculative prototype for an artificial womb, uh, which was very future scenario thinking about like technology and reproduction. But in order to think about the future, um, I also think it's important to uh, research where we are now with technology and reproduction and where we came from. So I wanted to dive into IVF and this whole world around it. Uh, also because I kind of know what it entails, this pr process, but I don't really know. Um, so I, I, I dived into that um, process. And also, uh, well, this, this research was to, it was two parts. So it was more a societal part, um, what it means, this process uh, of reproduction and using, well, assisted reproduction and how the process actually goes. Yeah, because we use IVF already for more than 40 years. It's the first IVF baby, Louise Brown. She uh, was born, she, she turned 40 in 2018, I think. I didn't know it was that old, um, the, this technology. Um, so I went to the fertility clinic. So I did the whole research, like how does it actually go? And then alongside, I did research um, on uh, different narratives and stories in uh, in society, like how do you um, how do you know when you want to have children? Which is a very big question. Is it very biological or is it more of a rational decision? And when I was working on the artificial womb, I thought like if we have children with artificial wombs, it would be such um, way more a rational process. But then again, when I was thinking about gay couples to reproduce is for them also a very rational process. They have to really think about uh, how they want to do it. They have to make such good, um, well, yeah, they really have to get everything on paper and okay, this is how we're going to do it. It's way more rational than um, uh, straight couples. So I wanted to make that more equal and have also a narrative for this more rational side of it and uh, IVF, was a good example of that. Um, so I think what happened was there was so much research. I uh, dived in the, the process of IVF and I had all this like different stories in society about, uh, about reproduction. And then I decided to narrow it down again with a new research question. And that was how I wanted to make IVF more romantic. Uh, so now, it was narrowed down and now I could go back to the clinic and look through the romance glasses <laughs> into the clinic and see how, uh, what I could find uh, with that way of looking. And the one thing that I found in the clinic was like that everyone has their own uh, paths that they're walking in the clinic. So when you come in as a couple, if we take uh, a man and a woman, uh, the woman goes to uh, the left side to the to a room for uh, the check uh, for checkup to a checkup room on the left side, but then uh, the, the the man has to go to a separate room all the way on the other side of the clinic. And then the healthcare professionals they have their own uh, corridors. So it reminded me of choreographies because it needs to be in a certain time frame. Uh, you need to count a lot of stuff during an IVF process. So um, I thought about these courtship dances of uh, animals when they find, when they're trying to find um, another mate to mate with. Mm -hmm.
so I had all these visions of weird choreographies <laughs> performed by humans in the clinic, but that was going to be very um, uh, abstract and we're not going to do that. Uh, and I kind of wanted to make something that you could actually use. Um, and then when I was researching all the different paths, I, uh, I was mapping them out. And then certainly I saw that there was, or um, uh, at one point I saw that there was another new path emerging and that was the path of the embryo. And uh, with conception in the bedroom, you can only kind of guess when it actually happens and that it's so uh, visible that you can follow it like from the actual beginning is actually quite uh, nice. Uh, so I kind of thought maybe that's the romantic part of IVF or maybe I should make that romantic. On day one, fertilization is assessed. All eggs determined to be normally fertilized are moved into new culture dishes, but only after two embryologists have verified that the patient information matches. Fertilization is determined based on the number of polar bodies and pronuclei visible. The eggs shown here each have two pronuclei visible in the cytoplasm, which means that they are normally fertilized, having received both maternal and paternal genetic material. This root of the embryo that um, became the main thing for the concept for lab romanticism to kind of find a way to make that tangible. And that's how, yeah, that's how I made that ritual. So the process of IVF is quite long, um, but there's one part of the, well, the part of the IVF process is that you have to wait. Uh, the ritual is for the few days that you have to wait when the most important thing happens in the clinic. It's, it's when the embryo, when the, uh, the egg uh, get fertilized, um, which is normally a very intimate moment that happens in the bedroom. But now as parents, you're not a part of it because when you go to the clinic, you go, uh, the, the sex cells will be taken out of the body. So uh, the egg from the woman and the sperm from the man, and then it goes to the lab. And then the embryologist will do uh, the conception and uh, the first few days of the, of the embryo. But as parents, you don't get to see even this room where it happens. When you go to the clinic and the sex cells leave the body, you go home. And then you, then the ritual starts. Um, it's, it's kind of a clock and a calendar in one. Uh, and it's counting down. And it also, it's also based on the Matryoshka, the Matryoshka doll, the, the Russian souvenir, but it, that also has to do something with fertility and family. Uh, but then you put like, there's two little marbles that you put together in one little dish, uh, on day one or day zero. It's, it's actually day zero. And then on day one, it goes into the incubator and day two, uh, and then you put the little dish into the next one. Uh, and so you go to through four days and then the embryo is big enough to be transferred back into the womb. So when all the dishes are put together, then it's time to go back to the clinic for the embryo transfer. What I wanted to make tangible with this ritual uh, because otherwise you're just sitting and waiting and there's all this important stuff happening outside uh, of your hands. Uh, so I wanted to kind of symbolize what happens in this lab. And then you could, uh, you could do that. You could perform this ritual together. So it kind of also makes some sort of new intimate connection between um, the, the parents and yeah, make it more mindful because that's the hard part with waiting. I think that it's just, maybe it feels really long, but yeah, if you, if you could do that more mindfully, then maybe it is something uh, romantic. It could be something more intimate. You kind of, this, this um, path of the embryo kind of starts and then uh, if, because with IVF, it doesn't always work out. So when the embryo is transferred back into the womb, uh, hopefully it will just stay there and then um, it will lead to a pregnancy, but it, that's not always the case. So I think it's quite nice that you went through this process. Um, 
if you went through this process and uh, you've had an embryo transfer and it doesn't work out, you kind of you can leave this in your house as kind of a yeah a thing to remember this process by, and then maybe you start a new one. But this was a trial, and this was also important, and it's also quite emotional. So it's I think I think it could be nice to have something tangible that you can just leave out there and just watch. And then I think the if it works out and it becomes a pregnancy, um, you can just um, take the all the dishes that are put together and move it to the middle. That's kind of the last step into the um, uh, last step of the ritual. And then you can also leave it as as like a I don't know the word for it in English as a yeah also like a, a sort of monument and you can just leave it there. And then when you're done with it, you can just uh, put it together because it's a kit and then just keep it <laughs> or give it to someone else. I think when you're in the, in the clinic, it's designed very well on a medical level and, um, uh, and that all the uh, medical professionals can do their job very well because of course it's really important that everything just works really well because you want this pregnancy to happen. But it's also a very emotional process um, and a meaningful process, but this meaning isn't really designed in this whole process. So I think designers could do that. And I hope I kind of contributed to that by uh, designing this narrative. Now, premature birth, which is defined as a birth before 37 weeks, is globally the biggest cause of death among newborns. While incubators can save the lives of some premature babies, they can also leave them with long-term disabilities. Now, scientists in the Netherlands say they're within 10 years of developing an alternative, an artificial womb that could save many more lives and reduce the risk of disabilities. Well, as part of our 100 Women series... Yeah, I think that when you think about like uh, future reproduction uh, technologies, like an artificial womb, for example. Um, well, no, um, let me go back. Like we use this technology of IVF for 40 years already, uh, but you're still like very much um, a slave of this technology when you go into the when you go into the clinic. And I think it should be more. Yeah, like a holistic thing that you have this meaning and the narratives also in the clinic. Um, and there's, I think there's different uh, little ways that you can um, design this. Uh, and I noticed that medical professionals are not thinking about it, that that's why we need designers. Um, what designers can do is kind of translate these, if we talk about like technological or uh, scientific insights or possibilities. I think designers can really translate this into something tangible or something that people can interact with. So they can communicate this uh, in some kind of way. But I think it can also go beyond this communicative role and then um, um, kind of uh, reflect on cultural things or um, ethical implications of uh, of technologies. So then you go more towards the debate kind of side of design. Um, but it could also, yeah, it can serve as like a translation uh, and a way of, uh, and, a, and a kind of invitation to interact and think about. It could also create a reflection, I think. Um, and design is catalyst. You can uh, look at that in different ways, but I see design as a catalyst for conversation or debate. Um, and it's very interesting. It's also, again, an uh, interest, uh, interesting metaphor uh, because it's kind of uh, increases the rate of a chemical, chemical reaction, uh, a catalyst, but it doesn't get consumed, uh, which I think is very interesting. Uh, so for me, so that's kind of where I started on this designer's catalyst platform. I, I started thinking 
about design in that way and that you can start a conversation using design. And that's what I uh, developed uh, during my master's. And I think it came together quite well uh, at the, um, for in the design for the artificial womb installation because that was really like a tool for debate because uh, artificial wombs are, are uh, well, scientists are working on a working uh, functional artificial womb. But this is very um, uh, intrusive technology if it can, if it actually works. So I think it's important to have a conversation on a general level, what we think about this technology. If you start talking to, I don't know, the first guy or woman you see on the street and you tell them about artificial wounds, they're like, oh no, we're going to make babies in factories and stuff. Um, because that's the first reaction you have. But to have like a more informed um, discussion with these people, you need to give them more tools to think about this scenar the different scenarios. And by um, translating the, the te technological possibilities, uh, into something that design, uh, well, that um, people can interact with, then you can really have that conversation uh, way more easily. Because when people are standing next to this uh, artificial womb installation, they're like, uh, but why is it not see-through? Um, which is an interesting thing. Like, oh, do you, do you need it to be see-through? Why do you need it to be see-through? Um, and so... Uh, in this way, there's different things that are left to the imagination in this um, installation. So there's little hooks that people can ask questions instead of just saying like, oh, no, we're going to make babies in, in factories. We're going to talk about this image. Like, okay, it looks like this. How do you feel about this? Why do you feel uncomfortable that it looks like this? How should it look? Um, then, yeah then this, this conversation is way more flowing. And I think that's quite important. You wouldn't really imagine putting your baby in a plastic bag. So we need to th think about the, a design to save your baby or to have your baby totally outside of the uh, female uterus. The baby grows and after four weeks, uh, we do the birth again. It's a very thin line between a dream come true and horrific science fiction film. Um, yeah, the Artificial Womb project is a project uh, initiated by uh, Next Nature Network. It was a collaboration with Next Nature Network and uh, Maxima Medical Center Eindhoven. Uh, in the Maxima Medical Center, they are working towards building an actual functional um, artificial womb for uh, humans. Uh, and they're focusing really on the uh, premature baby. So uh, if a baby gets born at 24 weeks, um, their chances of survival are very low. Uh, but if you can put them in some sort of artificial womb for four more weeks, they have uh, a way better um, chance on survival. And at Next Nature Network, they were already researching this future. Uh, they were researching the new technologies in this area of uh, reproduction. Also, like all these crazy scenarios that men can be pr can get pregnant or um, like exogenesis. Uh, this, this, this means that you have the, the pregnancy, the full pregnancy outside the body. So they've been doing research for two years already, I think, before I joined them, because uh, they needed a designer to translate, to translate all this research that they already did into a installation. So I was like, yay, <laughs> maybe I can do that. Um, so I worked together with the designers at Next Nature to um, make this installation, uh, the Dutch Design Week in 2018. It was a very short, I had a very short amount of time to translate it into this uh, installation, but I think that worked really well because we had to make quick decisions. 
yeah, and it, and it was just the, the design brief was um, how should a artificial womb look like? And it was very uh, free to think about, but also at the same time informed by um, the, all the knowledge of the Maxima Medical Center. So it was a really interesting collaboration. Yeah, so we made this really big uh, prototype for an artificial womb. Um, it consisted of five big balloons with all these different tubes um, and things hanging from it, uh, which were all based on a uh, patent drawing from 1955. It, it um, shows how, yeah, how an artificial womb should work, and then plus the information from the Maxima Medical Center. We made a new design, but we also did that very intuitively because uh, we wanted to make it a little bit more whimsical than this very lab look uh, that you see quite quite a lot on the internet so you have this like a little yeah it's a it's an image of a a little lamb in a plastic bag which is one of the first actual working artificial rooms but if you look at that you wouldn't feel really comfortable putting a human baby into a plastic bag uh, that functions as an artificial womb so um, we were looking at more of a way of cultivation, like a new way of cultivation, like how, sh how should a, a nursery of the future look like? And we kept thinking about like these big pumpkin fields or botanical gardens, because these are also cultivated places where growth takes place. And you see that concept back in like the, the different sizes of the balloons, because some of the, the wombs are um, smaller, so they hang higher, and the bigger ones hang lower because they're fully grown. And uh, the print on the balloons is um, a very organic and unique print, uh, and the color is also very human-like, but then it's, well, it's in a perfect sphere, which is quite um, technological. <laughs> We're looking at my design for an artificial womb. It consists of five big balloons where babies would be in, um, yeah, kind of swimming in their own fluids. There's uh, different circulations with the tubes, circulation of fluids, of blood. It's important to think about this because otherwise I'm afraid that it would just be copied from the lab into our daily lives. If you walk around in the, in the fertility clinic as a designer, you will ask really different questions um, to the people that work there than they're used to. And also, I think it's very interesting that they didn't think uh, about stuff that I, that I see. I'm like, hey, why is it like this? Uh, and they're like, oh, never thought about it in that way. Um, so then you're critical in some kind of way on how they design stuff. Um, but when you talk about like more the future, uh, the future technologies, like for example, an artificial womb, um, I hope that scientists will take the critics and, uh, and the questions that we raise as designers. But I'm also very aware that they're just focusing on the functional functionality of it and they're not really thinking about the cultural uh, in, in implications of it and I think that's a, um, a little bit difficult. Yeah I think the artificial womb is just um, a difficult one because it has so many different implications especially for for women and uh, their freedom if you look at like abortion rights and stuff but then we go into this whole like difficult thing um, and I am I think that the scientists will think the scientists developing this artificial womb will think about it of course it should be on the top of a agenda I don't know if if they uh, are the ones that need to be thinking about it but I think they need to be open for for uh, people that are thinking about it, because maybe it's more. Well, I've been talking to talking to a um, to a woman. She is doing a PhD in law for artificial wounds. It's so interesting, and she just blew my mind with all these 
laws that that are already there for um, this type of technology or still need to be written, but it's very conservatively written, all these things. And I don't know, that was um, so interesting <laughs> to hear. And I was like, oh, this is such a different perspective. And of course, the scientist can't know all these laws and uh, what they're going to change. But I, I think they need to be more open for these collaborations with all these different kinds of dif disciplines. If you're working on these uh, big technological developments. I'm thinking about another thing. Uh, I, I worked uh, with Next Nature for a bit after the um, artificial wound project because we did a um, exhibition which is called Reprotisopia. Um, and I did the exhibition design for that. And we worked together with, uh, with uh, the Athena Institute uh, in Am uh, Amsterdam. They're part of the, uh, of the FU. And they're really uh, in the middle of like design and science. They're science, communica it's science communication. And it was very interesting from the beginning for this Reprotopia project to uh, see them working with us because they're like in this split between science and design because we are making all these assumptions and, oh yeah, we're going to do it like this and this, uh, this makes sense, right? And they're going to this just speak such different languages. So uh, yeah. And then when you work for a couple of months together, then it starts to take a sh take form and then it works, but it just takes time to understand each other. There was a pretty interesting um, experience. Uh, I've been working with uh, a few very smart women on uh, development of a new speculum which is um, the tool they use at the gynecologist. Yeah, we need, uh, we need a new design for that. So, uh, and also when you go through IVF uh, as, uh, as a woman, you will come across the speculum uh, a couple of times. Uh, so yeah, we're looking into making that, um, yeah, making a better, uh, better design for that, but also creating more um, autonomy and direction for women in that situation. I think that's very interesting. So it's more uh, the female healthcare so uh, side, more social design. Um, but I'm also still very interested in this future um, area of the beginning of life. And if this is a, if this is a domain that should be designed and if it's, if it can be designed, we should all be able to uh, discuss about how it should be designed. When you think about like designing the beginning of life, uh, it's easy to think about that you're going to make designer babies and design your child, but it's more about uh, the choices that we make in how we reproduce and the, the possibilities that are there. And we should be able to look beyond the limitations of like a uh, lack of re relational or uh, intimate interactions, because I think that we can design that. Uh, and then if we design this and this new narratives, um, then we can kind of accept and live with these new technologies because within reproduction, we already use so many technology, uh, so, so many technologies. So to think that it's all very natural is also not very true so yeah i guess that's what i'm trying to do to kind of create this new narratives um, to produce meaning for these uh, technologies that we use in this domain through her designs lisa wonders whether new romantic ideals are possible and how this reality could be shaped with the help of new technology as we heard she investigates this by means of interactive installations or by creating conversation pieces her approach works for example 
The fragments you listen to were broadcasted on BBC News. At Futurebase, we believe that, as paradoxical as it might sound, by allowing possible futures and imagining alternatives, we make space for fresh notions of both ourselves and the world. Science and design are a not-to-be-underestimated power couple. Nevertheless, I wonder if we are, in our enthusiasm, also underestimating the importance of reflecting on ethical questions and considerations. Due to technology, there are endless problem-solving possibilities. However, should we aim for everything that is possible? Sources of the sound fragments and more information about Lisa and show notes can be found on futurebased.org. Follow us on Instagram, LinkedIn or Twitter for the newest updates. Thank you so much for listening. Until next time.